by Alison Morris and Peter Hitchens. Great to see you both again. Peter, let's start with uh, the front of the Daily Mail. Uh, two images there. One of the statue of Winston in uh, Westminster, which has been defaced, and also the statue in Bristol of the slave trader being uh, chucked into the harbour. Lawless and reckless, the headline. Uh, do you agree? Yes, I do. And to me, the more shocking of the two is the Winston Churchill statue. You can think what you like about Winston Churchill, and many people have strong criticisms of him, but the, the defacing of the statue of the person who's actually responsible for the preservation of our liberty to protest is a particularly repellent thing, and nobody is entitled to do it. You'd also think, to look at these demonstrations, that there was an overthrow going on of some horrible fascist regime in this country, which had been supporting slavery, uh, when, in fact, this country was in the forefront of, of those nations which suppressed slavery many, many years ago. And the, the whole issue of whether statues should be up or down seems to be one to be dealt with by civil society in a peaceful way, not by the tearing down of, of, of monuments. We were, we were, I'm the, sorry to interrupt. We were a leading power in the slave trade, weren't we? This man uh, yes, brought thousands of, uh, uh, of um, slaves uh, uh, to America. Yes, but four centuries ago. And the commemoration of, of him is, is, is obviously... I can quite see why people might want to get rid of the statue, but the pulling down of the statue in the centre of the city... Uh, it, it seems to me to be quite beyond the, the limits of political debate. And the other thing about it which worries me ever so slightly is that I, I don't, frankly, want to hold any brief for 17th century slave traders. But if you're going to destroy the past and destroy evidence of the past, then you're destroying memory. Something should be done with the statue, but it shouldn't be pulled down by a mob. Uh, in, with a parents, as far as I can see from these films of the, of the police, it should be pulled down by mob, it should be removed by consent, by public agreement, and it should be put somewhere uh, where its origins and the reason why it's been taken down should be explained. And serious countries, I think, behave like this. And yeah. it, it isn't as if this is, this is a fascist country which has suddenly been, uh, suddenly been liberated by these self-regarding demonstrators. Uh, it's a free country in which it's free to protest against the existence of the statue, but it remains, it seems to me, completely beyond the law to pull something down uh, by by violence in, 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 okay. in, in the middle of the city. It'd be good to get your thoughts, Alison. Um, um, Home Secretary said today that it distracted from the, that the cause of the Black Lives Matter movement. Would you agree with that? I don't think the statue should have been there in the first place. I think it should have been removed a long time ago and, as Peter said, put in a museum and maybe we should be teaching children in school um, the history of slavery, which was only abolished less than 200 years ago in Britain, and the history of that and, and the, the knock-on effect of that, which we are still seeing. And so the, the, the reason for these protests I don't think is being discussed because we're talking about statues and we're talking about graffiti and all sorts of other things. But, I mean, just recently we've, we have seen that there was a, a disproportionate amount of of um, people from the um, of people from ethnic minorities who were impacted by the coronavirus, there's been more deaths among Black people than there has been, and that's disproportionate. There's lots of reasons for that. It's due to all sorts of things with poor health, poor housing, the fact that a lot of people who are put in the front face of jobs, the people who are doing jobs that kept the place going during lockdown, the people who put themselves at more risk are, are doing those low-paid jobs. All of that is something that these people are protesting for, and it's not being discussed, and it should be discussed. And I think that. Pretty Patel's um, attitude towards that up until now, I don't think it's been great. And I do think that the government could very easily quell these protests. They could very easily try and get law and order back in, in, in place. But they should do so by addressing the issues and the very genuine concerns of some of these protesters. This is not just about a death in America. This is about what's happening in the here and now. OK. Um, let's move <laughs> on uh, to the front of the... Guardian, uh, talk about the ongoing coronavirus uh, crisis. A very sad story, Peter, uh, an exclusive by uh, The Guardian's health policy editor. People dying alone often left for up to two weeks, uh, he's discovered. Yes, it's a very distressing story to read and contains details which I, I, I'm not going to repeat, but you can imagine what happens if someone is, is, is left lying dead for one or, or two weeks uh, alone. But it seems to me to undermine one of the effects of this shutdown of our society, which is the, the leaving of quite large numbers of people, old people, especially entirely on their own, with, with nobody to look after them or, or, or care for them. And these are obviously almost obscene 
tragedies, which many other lesser tragedies and miseries going on from people who are, who are stuck on their own for week after week after week in this incessant uh, house arrest. And I think it's particularly grievous for the old who, who are cut off from all the things which have kept them uh, healthy and, and happy. And I, I, it stands as a symbol of it to me. I, I, it, it is, as I say, extremely distressing. Uh, Alison, uh, perhaps a cause for optimism on the front of the Metro. Uh, the number of deaths uh, due to uh, coronavirus or of people who have uh, uh, tested for coronavirus down to 77, uh, which is, is, uh, is, is good news. It is, and then I was delighted to see that because we all have been watching, you know, as those graphs, as the figures drop and as the curve lessens as it goes along. There was no deaths recorded. There was one yesterday. We've noticed a real decline in community transmission here. Many of those deaths are still in care homes or among the elderly and vulnerable, and that's something that needs to be addressed. But I do think that there's cause for hope here and, and there is cause for, for optimism because we can't see the levels of community transmission are definitely reducing. The problem is we still have vulnerable people who are at risk. And just as Peter was saying previously, a lot of those people may be isolated. They may not have a social security safety net. They may not have them. So I think that the, the, the money and all the attention and the direction should be now focused on making sure those people are catered for as we move out of lockdown. Uh, every uh, death, of course, uh, a huge tragedy, but uh, maybe some glimmer uh, of hope there. Um, moving on to the Daily Telegraph, uh, Peter, uh, quarantine measures come in tomorrow. People returning to the UK must be in quarantine for uh, two weeks uh, at home, but it's not going to work. The Home Office concedes, uh, according to the Telegraph. Tell us about this. Well they've, well, they've worked out that it is unenforceable, that they, they simply don't have the people, the, the, the equipment, uh, or indeed the really the power uh, to enforce it. And they're also under enormous pressure from the airlines and from the travel industry who are going to court against this policy to say, why on earth are you doing this? And I look at the story and I think, as I look at every story about this quarantine since it was first announced, and think, who on earth came up with this? What did they think they were doing? And, and why is it that a government which is at least apparently composed of intelligent human beings has yet to say, actually, this has been a silly mistake, let's get rid of it? Well, pretty the, the says it, 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 quite simply, the, 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 the Home Secretary says it's to stop a devastating second wave. Well, the Home Secretary can, can say what she likes, but there doesn't seem to be any evidence of that. Indeed, the, the whole idea of a second wave is, is increasingly in doubt. Uh, the, the distinguished microbiologist, Professor Hugh Bennington, is in, is in considerable doubt as to whether any such thing is going to happen. And I, I can't see why this would be the time to introduce this. At the moment, as you'll see from several other front pages, one of the much bigger concerns in the government is how on earth we can restart the economy, which the, the, the government has, has crashed. And if you don't allow vital industries, such as the airline travel industries, to get going again, then that will make that very difficult indeed. I, I said, just look at it more and more. I think, how has the government not got round to, 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 to abandoning this policy? It will have to abandon it in the end anyway. It might as well get on with it. Um, what, what do you make of this, um, Alison? Is it a sensible policy? Um, it, it seems to have worked in, in other countries. Could it, could it work here or is it being brought in too late? I think it, it, at the very beginning, we had numbers of infection rates in places like Italy and France and people were freely travelling um, in and out of the UK. That was the time to put a quarantine in and that was the time to tell people they had to self-isolate for two weeks if they came from elsewhere. Right now, I think when you see that numbers have, have fallen, right across Europe. So people are, are coming from countries where the orbit would be lower than it would be in the UK. A huge amount of resource. I, I've noticed some of the countries who have managed to do the quarantine, it's been very strict. In some cases, they've over tagged, mm -hmm. almost like failed to make sure they are in the home address. In other cases, all of those sort of things, I think, are unworkable. And in, from a purely local perspective, we live in a place with a land border and people cross that to use the airport in Dublin or from the other side to use the airports in Belfast. And that way you'd be crossing two jurisdictions. And I don't even think that it's legal for those two countries to be sharing people's private data back and forward in relation to that. So, no, I, I, I don't think it's workable. I think it's something the ports and airports should have had restrictions on them at the very beginning of the pandemic. To put them on now is a bit, you know, more stable. You know, it's, it's, I think it's just too late. 
OK, interesting point of view. Uh, Alison, Peter, thank you both for now. Stay there if you don't mind, because coming up as lockdown lifts in England, Northern... Welcome back to the press preview. Alison and Peter still with me. There they are. Alison, let's look at the front of the eye. Stay-at-home warning for northern cities. Uh, this is discussing the idea of, of local lockdown, uh, lockdown. We're already leaving, you know, in, on a different time scale. And so now we're looking at, like, you know, different time scales within a region, and that would be very strange. But it's looking, you should be looking, I think they need to look at the reasons why there are higher rates of infections in certain towns and cities than there are in others. You would imagine that London would be the most adversely Six, affected. Five, but the fact is it's dropped, four, the, the infection three, rates are dropping in London. Two, but we need to look at why one, that's happening in the northern exercise, cities. Um, in a lot of cases in Northern Ireland, we found in, in so towns that it would be like food one, production plants and, and factories and things where people two, weren't initially social distance and that was three, pushing the R rate up. But I think in, in relation to that, it's very difficult to start taking very small areas and saying this area has to behave in a different than, than the one next door because people are going to see people out and about behaving in a different way and it's going to be very hard to enforce that. Yeah, Peter, there's no doubt about it. Different parts of the country are seeing uh, different results. Uh, only a handful of infections taking place daily in London now, but obviously other parts of the country are uh, struggling different ways. I mean, do you think that uh, regional lockdowns could Morning, work? Morning, guys. So today... Well, I think any attempt to go back to tight restrictions on people's movements is going to be deeply unpopular and almost impossible to enforce. But I have to say, people should be more sceptical about this R rate. Dr John Lee uh, suggests that it's pretty subjectively based. And, and how are we measuring these infections? How can, it, They tend to be more of a reflection of how many tests there have been than how many infections there are. And what's an infection anyway? For most people, uh, it doesn't actually add up to very much. I think that there is a great longing in this country to get out of this and to start working and living again. And I think any excuse put together to try and prevent that or to go back to where we were is going to be both unpopular, unsuccessful and mistaken. Uh, so I hope that this course isn't followed, particularly very strongly for the, for the sakes of the people who would be caught in it if it were. Well, uh, following on uh, that theme, uh, the FT is saying save the summer. Ministers want pubs and restaurants to reopen on June the 22nd, uh, Alice, uh, Alison. Um, what do you make of that? Good idea? Well, I'm all for pubs and restaurants reopening. I think it's <laughs> one of the hardest things I've found about the lockdown is that social aspect, you know, even just going for a drink after work on a Friday, all of those sort of things. And I know when I look at my mansions and the WhatsApp message groups I have with friends and family, it's the thing that they ask most about hairdressers, I think, are the things that people are obsessed about as to when they're going to open. Um, we have I've been given a time scale here. I think that we should be looking at pubs. We think there needs to be a slow progression of that. It needs to be carefully managed. Board of government and its staff are properly trained and protected. But I've been watching with interest and with envy in other European cities um, as people are sitting around outside in cafes, meeting friends, having lunch, having a few drinks. And I think that all of us, you know, look at that quite obviously and think that we look forward to the day that we can we can get back to that. Talk about you don't know what you've got until it's gone. It's, it's something that I've definitely missed. Indeed. Uh, it's been great having you both on. Uh, have a good week ahead. Irish News is Alison Morris, Peter Hitchens from uh, the Mail on Sunday, both columnists uh, for those papers. Thank you both very much. Great to see you.